This podcast provides a platform for our guests to share their experiences and inspire our listeners to be brave and bold in pursuit of their dreams. As you listen, we invite you to explore how these concepts apply to your own story. You know what to do. Be great and be grateful. We're mic'd up with Mike DeChocho. All right, guys, we're here with Evelyn Kessler. Evelyn, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you have a lot going on between um, your nonprofit that you started and obviously your full-time career and your full-time family and all the, all the juggling that you're doing and you took time to be <laughs> yeah. here today. And I appreciate it. And I know my audience will appreciate it as well because you have a story uh, and, and thankfully, you know, the, the most important part of your story, the more I think about it, is that you're here today to tell it, right? Mm-hmm. And, and people, you're going to understand what I mean by that because I'm going to read your bio quickly to bring everybody up to speed. Uh, but it's definitely, you know, trials and tribulations is the nicest way I can put it here. Um, and what's really inspiring for me and the reason, number one reason I wanted you on the show is because of, um, you know, what the story tells about your character. You know, your family was through, went through a lot and what, what you've done with it. And instead of playing the victim, you've turned it into so many mm-hmm. good things over the years. And I'm, I feel like I'm just getting, obviously, to know you and learn more about you. So that's what's inspiring to me. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so you could kick back for a minute. I'm going to bring everybody up to speed on your bio. And then I have questions uh, here as the skeleton of the show. And again, thank okay. you for being here. Thanks. Evelyn's family is originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC, and she was the only one of eight children born in the U.S., actually in Amherst, New York, right here locally. Her family left Western New York in 1986 to return to the DRC after her father obtained his Ph.D. in education from the University at Buffalo. She left to the DRC in 94 when the genocide turmoil in neighboring Rwanda began to trickle into the country. She was fortunate to have left before the war was in full swing and traveled to Paris for high school, actually, crazy, and then to Buffalo in 97 to continue her education, if that wasn't enough, right? Then she obtained her Bachelor in Business Administration from Madai College in 05, and while she was there, Evelyn married her husband, Steve, and they have two children, Imani and Leo, beautiful story there, and while she was in college, Evelyn started her own image and fashion consulting business, we're going to learn more about that. And she helped her clients enhance their image and their personal brand. How am I doing? Am I looking sharp today for you? Hey, you're looking sharp today. Looking all right. <laughs> she went on to found International Child Advancement, a nonprofit organization with a mission to empower orphans and disadvantaged children through education, vocational training, livelihood provision, and mentoring. And that's what we're really interested to hear the most about because it ties into to your past. In December of 17, Evelyn was celebrated by the, make sure I'm saying it right, is it Afro, Afro Impact Magazine? There you go, yeah. And for her work empowering disadvantaged children in the DRC, and in June of 19, recently, she was featured in the national publication Success Magazine. Awesome, right? And that's where I actually hey. first discovered her. I was sitting in the waiting room, <laughs> waiting to get my hair cut. And I'm checking out, I brought my magazine with me and I'm flipping through and I'm like, from Amherst, New York, (laughs) why do I not know her yet? And then guess what I did? I sent you a message on LinkedIn and you were cool. You You wrote back in like five minutes and I just knew you had that it factor about you. And um, so I'll wrap up with, with this and then we'll hit the questions. But over the past 15 years, Ellen has grown in the financial services and banking sector and she's currently in the role of compliance specialist at m and Bank while heading the International Child Advancement. So, Yay. yes. So, again, there's a lot there. Um, we talked about, you know, the, the turbulation in the beginning. Um, mm-hmm. So I want to start with ICA, okay? Is mm-hmm. there anything in the bio that you want to add that I didn't hit on there? Probably will come out in the conversation. Well, yeah, I'm sure it will come up. There, there's quite a lot to fill in. <laughs> yeah. So did I do okay there though? I, I covered the, yeah, the you, you, you really squished everything together really well. So really summarize. So that's a good summary because there are so many pieces, right. That, mm. that can fill in the cracks and it's kind of hard to keep it nice, short and sweet. So you did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, no problem. But as far as, 
yeah, as far as ICA is concerned, um, you know, how that came about really was the experiences I went through and my family went through. Mm -hmm. um, as you shared, my family's originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Right. And um, when my dad obtained his, his degree from the University of Buffalo, his student visa had expired. And at that point, you're required to return to your country of origin, which we did. So he packed up all the kids. We, you know, my parents packed us all up and we returned to the Congo. Now, one thing to point out is that they were going through a very difficult time at that point. Um, you know, not only did they have to up and leave, you know, a country that they become accustomed to, but they were going through a divorce at the time as well. Oh, so right. having to move to a new country. Yeah having to look for work, having to look for a home. It, it, was, it was so many things that at the same time. Mm. So not only was it challenging for them to navigate, but it was challenging for us as kids as well. Um, and during that time when we went back to the Congo, you know, they had to figure out, okay, what are we going to do with the kids? So at the time there were six of us. So five of us stayed with my paternal grandma who um, did the best that she can, you know, all of a sudden she had five girls with her. <laughs> so she had to figure out how to navigate the day to day. And unfortunately, you know, she didn't have the means to, to provide for us. So there were days where we had maybe one meal or mm -hmm. none, uh, none at all, because she was going through a difficult time herself. And education in the Democratic Republic of Congo is not free. So during the couple of years we lived with her, we didn't go to school either. Mm -hmm. So that kind of ties in a little bit to me understanding, in a sense, uh, at a certain level, what the orphans we support go through, because mm -hmm. they, you know, a lot of them, until we can get them the sponsorship needed, they're not going to school. And right now, the situation is quite dire, where they eat once a day, sometimes twice a day, if, if the opportunity is there if they receive the donations or if we get enough donations to send additional funds for that. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I can kind of relate, but you stop me when you want to, but I wanted to, I figured I'll share kind of bit the story and the progression as to how I got to founding ICA. Right. Um, yeah. So I have some questions too about, about some of the adversity. Um, and I, can clearly understand the motivation behind starting the organization because of how close it is to your heart and your experiences. Can you share more about how you, how you made that passion a reality? So, you know, a lot of times entrepreneurs or um, aspiring or budding entrepreneurs, we have these ideas, right? And I'm sure you mm -hmm. had it in your heart for a long time as you're growing up, like I'm going to do something once I'm able to do it. And then you acted. Yeah. So can you kind of walk us through that? So if someone has a, a great idea, whether it's a nonprofit or simply a product or service they want to bring into the universe and the fact mm -hmm. you made it a reality. So how, what, how can you describe doing that? Well, uh, for me personally, it took me years. It took mm -hmm. me quite a while because I had to overcome myself. And that would be the first thing I would say is over, you have to overcome yourself and that may translate to something different for each person, right? For me, right. it was the fear of failure. It was the fear of criticism or the fear of lack of knowledge, whatever it is. I think that oftentimes is the biggest challenge for many people because when I speak to others, you know, they often say the same thing. Oh, I don't know. It's not going to be successful. It's not going to work out. It's too hard, you know, so overcome yourself. Number two, I would say, is um, you really need a few key elements to get you started and to push you. And this is from my own personal experience, I would have to say. And mm -hmm. I had to come up with an acronym for myself, <laughs> not only to get me going, but I often refer back to this acronym as I'm, you know, progressing through this journey of, with ICA. And that acronym is PEACH, P, cool. passion, E, easily digestible story, A, accomplishment, C, coalition, H, hear, slash, listen. And I'll break it down just really quickly. So passion, you really need to have that drive and the passion for what you're going to do. You know, I've seen oftentimes where people end up getting into a venture or what have you because either they were pressured or they thought it was something they should do, but 
at the core, it wasn't necessarily their calling or something that they, they should get into. So make sure you really have the passion yeah. to, to do what it is that you want to do. Next to that is, you know, what is your story? And have you narrowed down your story to a point where it's easily digestible? You know, when you speak to your potential customers, when you speak to potential donors, can they relate or can they understand what it is that you're trying to convey, what it is you're selling, what it is you want them to do? Mm -hmm. As far as um, accomplishments, when you're first starting off, of course, you're not going to have a whole resume of items that you've been able to accomplish thus far. But if you've helped one or two people or if you've sold your product to, say, your neighbors or family members, those are some accomplishments that you can share as you as you talk about your story to demonstrate hey this is what i've done so far to back up what it is that you're trying to push forward mm -hmm. and then uh coalition you need your village you need your circle of influence you need those people beside you who are going to be by your side who are going to push you forward who are going to mentor you who are going to help you get you to that next level and i'm going to add to that that it's not all only about taking and receiving, but you also have to reciprocate, right? So you need to collaborate and make sure that as much as people are helping you, that you return that as well and that you support them and their endeavors and you show up for them. And lastly, hear slash listen. You need to hear from those individuals that you're trying to help or sell to. Uh, oftentimes, you know, I saw the mistake made where people assume, okay, these kids are hungry or they don't have this or that. Well, all right, I'm going to ship X, Y, Z, and that should take care of it. Mm -hmm. Well, did you did you sit down with them to really understand what they want, what will be beneficial to them, what's going to work for their environment? Because when you ship, say, clothing, and we made the mistake when we were first starting off to ship clothes to to the the Congo, but not realizing, hey you're hurting some of the local businesses there, right? Mm -hmm. If funds are sent, they can use that money to then buy clothing locally, which will support the local business there and empower those people there. So really taking a, the, the time to sit down and, and hear from your customers, hear from your potential donors as to what will push them really and what, what will motivate them to support you and to buy from you. Very of course, well. last but not least, you can't forget about capital. You got to raise that capital. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, at the end of the day, that is the, the mission, right? But it's what the purpose is for the mission, you know, and the yeah. purpose behind it is everything you talked about, your passion, living through it, unfortunately, and fortunately that you're here to talk about it. And um, I really like how you organize that very well. Um, I think people can benefit from even that, having a, a roadmap to success. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you're doing something for the first time, and you're not mm -hmm. sure what that roadmap looks like, you can model success. Did you find yourself doing that either reaching out to mentors early on or reading or using YouTube as kind of a university to, to find out how to start a nonprofit? Absolutely. You know, I started off knowing zero. And that was part of the issue. Uh, the biggest part of my fear, I was so terrified of the amount of work it would take because I would Google and see this whole laundry list of requirements. And I was like, okay, no, I can't do this. I can't do it. Uh, so I really, you know, was reading books. I was, as you said, YouTube, anything I could read and, and um, get my hands on to learn of how to properly run a nonprofit, how to grow it. Um, that was definitely a must and especially reaching out to mentors and talking to people who have done it and have been successful continuously learning from them and that's a continuous thing even right. today that i continue to do yeah learning never stops i mean uh, absolutely and our environment is constantly changing and with technology it's ever changing faster than ever so mm -hmm. you have to be constantly in the know right absolutely right. right so um not to go backwards here in, in your story, but I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that were uh, devastating because of the, uh, and I'm talking about the transition into where you're at today. Uh, I feel it's important. The first one here of, of Peach is passion. And your passion comes from a lot of hardship. And um, so, you know, again, the genocide in R Rwanda, it was gruesome and devastating to say the least. I mean, you lost family members, right, in the war. 
Uh, yeah. This is an extremely tough subject because of everything. Just so if you're listening to this and maybe you're not too familiar with the mid nineties, the, the, the genocide that was going on in Rwanda, over 6 million people were killed and it left behind 4 million orphans. And, and for, for survival, you actually left and you lived with your uncle in Paris, as I mentioned earlier. So can you share with us the transition? What was it like to do that, to, to transition over to Paris and how ultimately that gave you a chance at a better life and education? Yeah, I would have to say it it was tough because, you know, living with my mom in the city of Goma, Goma is a really laid back, mm -hmm. uh, uh, just really nice city. And I enjoyed my time living there with, with my mother. After I had lived with my grandmother for some time, I moved in with my dad in the capital, Kinshasa, and then a few years later, moved to Goma, which borders Rwanda. And I was actually crossing the border every day to go to school. Um, and when the president of Rwanda was assassinated, my school that I was going to was bombed, was bombed during that period. Thankfully, no one was at the school and it happened over the weekend. Uh, but, you know, all of that just began, started a whole spiral as to what was going on with the genocide in Rwanda and mm -hmm. as people were fleeing and rebels were trickling in to 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 our country you know my mom just realized you know what you you know i'm gonna send you off to live with your uncle because it's not it's not looking safe here uh which which happened and it was extremely difficult you know having to leave behind everyone you know and and pick up and start over again and that you know frequently happened throughout yeah. throughout my childhood my siblings childhood having to you know get up leave it behind and start over and repeat the process a few times uh, so heading to Paris was exciting and terrifying at the same time you know having to get accustomed to a new new way of living a new culture and family members I'd never met before um, but it ended up working out, and and after three years of of going to school there and just coming back to Buffalo, to 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 get started on my education and my future. So I'm grateful that my mom made that decision, and she had the means at the time to to get me out of the country because oh. after I left, you know, things were got a lot worse. Yeah, it sounds like that was almost your the turning point. It, at the time, yeah. it maybe it didn't feel like it, but looking back at the whole picture here, that was really yeah. your turning point at a better chance, giving yourself a chance, a better life. Your mom made that decision, hard to separate mm -hmm. from your child. I can't even imagine that. And uh, it ultimately allowed you to have a, a better education. Um, you know, Can you share a little bit how, how some of these struggles in your past have helped you, your character, your perseverance? I mean, now when you run into a little bit of turmoil at the office, everyone's probably up in arms and you're like, look, I got this. We can get through. <laughs> yeah, you know, I have to say it all starts with my parents and my family. Um, you know, just watching them go through some of the things that they went through, how they handled it. And I have to say faith has been the biggest, the biggest um, piece of the puzzle, honestly. Mm -hmm because without without faith it it would have been quite trying in a very difficult situation and all, everyone has their way of dealing with sure. hardships um, but that's first and foremost the first thing that that i go to and that they've gone to mm -hmm. is prayer meditation and looking for those small opportunities to be grateful for what you do have um, so you know, those are some of the things that have helped me really overcome. And when I face hardship right now, I take myself back and think about certain situations that I went through back home or certain situations that some of my family members are dealing with um, mm -hmm. back in the Congo and just realizing, you know what, it's not that bad. <laughs> yeah, it's not that bad. You got this. You can you you got this. You can overcome it. Right. It gives you a, a different level of strength. I feel that you know because especially in business and running a nonprofit and being you're the face of the organization in a sense but i know you're mm -hmm. you know, it's not about you like you're probably the last right one. i'll speak for you but yeah um i realize nothing that you're doing with with ica is about you it's all about the kids mm -hmm. families impacted mm -hmm. 
But at the same time, when there's a question and that goes upwards, right? And you have to, yeah. you have to speak to it or answer to it. Um, you know, you have to deliver and, and you, you've delivered in so many other ways that it prepared you really to, to be strong now. Right. I guess that's, a, that's how you have to look at it. I mean, instead of sitting there, woe is me or going through a tough time. And it's like right away, your brain starts to solve for how can I use this to help me even today and then tomorrow. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's what's so important. I often, you know, try to empower, be it friends or, or people that I know, you know, you know, in the Bible, it says, you know, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning, mm -hmm. recognizing oh, that. that what you're going through, it's extremely hard. It's extremely difficult, but know that there is an end to it. Mm -hmm. So decide how you want to go through that valley. You know, mm -hmm. do you want to take the difficult path of looking at the negative and everything or of the situation? Or do you want to try to rise above it and see how you can turn your lemons into lemonade in a sense, right? Yeah. So that you can power through that difficult situation and try to overcome that. Yeah. And it's doing it while there's, you know, an unwavering question of yourself. Like, you, you know that you're not positive how it's going to actually come about, but you mm -hmm. know that you're not questioned, questioning yourself that it's going to happen. You just don't <laughs> yeah. know, you know what it's going to look like or how it's going to happen, but you're, you're doing everything you can. Um, question about your dad. So I, do you know the original reason why he selected Buffalo as your temporary home from the DRC? Because that was kind of the first move, right? Um, mm -hmm. Looking at the timeline, that was back in 1986, was it? It or was the, way before 86. It probably oh. was around 84. Okay. I honestly, I honestly, I'm not sure what the circumstances were, but I do know that he applied. There was some program that he found out about and he applied because at the time he was a principal of a school um, back in the Congo. And wow. so there were opportunities presented to him and he jumped on it as far as that's a little bit that I know. So maybe Buffalo was pitched to him as a good school to go to? I believe so. I yeah. think so. That might have been the circumstance, but yeah. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. So now that Buffalo and Western New York is your home and you've been here for quite some time and you have your beautiful family, uh, what are some characteristics that you love about Western New York? You know, I love the small town feel. Uh, initially, when I first arrived, you know, coming from Paris was a little difficult. It was quite a <laughs> shift, right? My brother took me downtown and he went around. He's like, okay, this is downtown. I was like, okay, so where's the real downtown? He's like, no, <laughs> this is downtown. <laughs> That's it. But after, after some years, you know, you get, you get accustomed to the lifestyle. And I really appreciate, um, you know, just the love, as they call the Buffalo love, right? That, yeah. you know, you just have that welcoming spirit, the welcoming spirit in Buffalo and, and knowing that, you'll have people who are really going to have your back and they're just going to hug you and be there for you. Whatever it is that you de decide that you want to take on, that they're right by your side. And we've had people um, support us in that way. And I'm extremely grateful. Yeah. They, they've embraced you and you're doing, I mean, what you're doing is so impactful. So it's like, you know, part of the reason having you on the show is to, to get it out to more people if they're not familiar I'm going to allow you at, at the end and I'm going to put it up. But if you want to tell us real quick, how can we learn more about ICA? What's the quickest way we can get there? Yeah, the quickest way is to go to our website, www.childadvancement.org. Okay. Also, we have our social media pages, Facebook. You can uh, find us under International Child Advancement and mm -hmm. Instagram, Child Advancement underscore org, I believe. Hopefully I didn't mess it up. <laughs> If that's not accurate, I'll, I'll make sure I research it and put the, the accurate tag in here for you. Um, as a compliance specialist, you're the executive director of uh, ICA and also the CEO of your family, right? <laughs> I'm sure they, they'd appreciate that comment, right? Great leader. <laughs> um, so, you know, you have your, your husband and your two children. How do you manage it all? I know that's a, a tough thing to manage even one of the three. How do you manage mm -hmm. all three of those? You know what? It's thanks to my village. <laughs> I thank God for my village every single day. And 
my village is my husband, my kids, my family, my friends, and just other other people in, in my life who have been so amazing and so supportive. But I also have to give a huge shout out to ICA volunteers because okay. without them, mm -hmm. we would not be able to accomplish what we accomplished. The board members and our volunteer staff they've all been amazing so thanks to all those people really that's my coalition right there mm -hmm. helping helping me and we help each other just make it happen how many volunteers do you have now i would say we have about a volunteer staff of roughly 14 people okay and that's all locally plus, and local? plus the board i'm sorry that's locally or that's around the world we have uh, most of our volunteers are local and we have an individual in washington dc actually we do have one in kenya uh in kenya africa and nice. yeah i think i think that's it actually yes new york city new york city new jersey so we're a little spread out yeah that's great um if someone's interested in being a volunteer they can go right to the website obviously yes Yes, they can go to our website and actually they can email us info at childadvancement.org. We are looking for volunteers, especially for our social media. And we do have some board members, uh, board member opportunities available if anyone is interested in applying. Uh, perfect. I, I certainly hope that gets you some traffic and the right <laughs> people coming your way. Um, and, so. you know, who, would, who wouldn't want to walk hand in hand with Evelyn, right? <laughs> well, I am a Rotarian, so I'm going to do kind of a shameless plug here. And the reason awesome. for it is you can see, I don't know if you can see that, but right there, Rwanda yeah. Cage on its past is the main story mm -hmm. in this magazine. I happen to be reading as I'm preparing for this interview. So it just was mm -hmm. natural for me to want to talk about it. And there's this really, uh, now it's a nice story, right? But it, it's a story about mm -hmm. after after all the genocides and everything that went on, uh, it, you know, right there in Rwanda, a library, it was decided that a library, I think this is this is it right here, um, was, was des designed and built. Have you been back? Have you been to this library? I have not. I have not been back home. I had plans on going home uh, this past October, but you know, as things were getting a little bit worse with Ebola, I decided to push back my trip. So yeah. hopefully this year and next year I can go. But that's beautiful. That's amazing they did that. But you wonder, you're like, you know, the first thing you think about is why a library? You know, these people need food, they need shelter, they need safety. And you build a library, right? That, and, and I read this whole article and it talks about the reason that the, the board and the people who put this together and invested in it felt a library was necessary. I'm going to read this quote right here. The regimes that were here knew that the best way to rule over people was to keep them ignorant. If you have a library accessible to everyone, it's much harder. So people mm. had means and access to knowledge and information for a better life. And they didn't yeah. Feel us captive. And there is there is a verse that says, my people perish for the knack of lot knowledge, right? So yeah. knowledge is so important. So uh, you should check this out. I think you'll, I mean, it'll probably be a tough read for you, but um, very, very cool to see, you know, and I can even maybe do an That's overlay. Beautiful. I'll yeah, try to find, find the article yeah. online and, and uh, overlay some of those images here for you as well. Please do. So, you were also, as we talked about, an image consultant for four years, right? And um, can you tell us about your passion for fashion? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in the Democratic Republic of Congo, you know, there's a saying where, you know, if you had a little bit money left, you would, you would dress first. You would buy yourself clothes first so you can look good because we just love fashion that much. We love fashion mm. so much. So I had a passion for fashion ever since I was a little girl. My mom actually owned her own business in Goma where mm -hmm. she she did tailor um, tailor made clothes for, for her, her clients. So it started there, just watching her, her style and mm -hmm. I wanted to emulate that when I grew up. And, and when the opportunity presented itself, I always knew that I wanted some kind of business. I wanted to start some kind of business. And I decided, hey, I love fashion. Let me help other people, you know, look nice. And 
and enhance their image. So I took some classes in Toronto and, and got started with style enhancers. And really, that's how I got into it. Started mm -hmm. uh, doing makeovers and image consulting for coworkers, friends, and, and people I knew. Mm -hmm. Is that anything you're currently involved in or more so just your own kind of passion for finding cool trends and your time in Paris probably gave you a lot of those designer brand, you know, that insight <laughs> and culture. A little, bit, a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, presently I'm not doing anything with, with that image consulting from time to time. I will, I, I am tapped uh, at my job to do presentations to incoming MDP students. So I've done that quite a bit this past year, which was really exciting. Cool. Um, but, but that's pretty much it. Just speaking to, to groups of people about, uh, your image and how how important it is the way you portray yourself, especially mm -hmm. as as you're looking for employment or as you're looking to to really build um, build your your image and and get that awareness out there about mm -hmm. who you are and what you're about. Yeah, I didn't have this planned as a question, but just to to kind of go off of that. So I recently saw TEDx, and I want, I hope I'm not butchering it but I believe it was Amy Cuddy do you ever hear the the TEDx where she talks about fake it till you make it but it's really not as simple as that it's more so like you said um when you bring yourself up and you're confident about your image and then all of a sudden your stature changes and the way you deliver right. information changes and it could be the yeah. same two people but one of them has more of a belief in themselves and the mm -hmm. quote unquote faking it although you know some people don't like the term it's because of what it sounds like but it's not necessarily right. that. It's more believe in yourself that you're already your best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. than like think that one day you're going to wake up and snap your fingers and all of a sudden you're that. So you, have, <laughs> right. you have to walk, right. even when you might have a few bucks in your account and it's day one of your new, of ICA and, you know, and, and um, you're not quite sure what it's going to look like, but you're already mm -hmm. acting as if you're five years in because you're that confident. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I try to look at things from a positive perspective. And even though we, we don't have millions of followers, even though we don't have millions in our account, my vision is that we will get there mm -hmm. one day. We will get there eventually. And you just have to keep plugging away at it. And I think I had recently recommended to you the book, The Compound Effect. Yeah talks about consistently having that discipline to consistently taking those steps, right, to get you to where you want to be, because then it's going to compound. It's mm -hmm. eventually going to compound, and you'll find yourself on that stage where you wanted to find yourself. So just consistently doing those little things is, um, is something that, you know, I, I continuously work on and, and firmly believe that if I don't give up, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. That positive we'll energy and compounding effect over time, you know, it starts with the foundation, right? And it's, I would say the foundation and you can, t I want to hear what your foundation is, but I think it's mindset and mentality. Cause if Absolutely. that's not there, like if your mindset and mentality is really broken, it's hard to build anything else on top of that. Cause if you're negative yeah. and you are even handed the answers, what are you going to do with it? If you're in the wrong mindset and mentality, um, and the reason I, I bring that up, and I want you to speak to that, a quote I noticed on your Facebook profile, I told you I was going to do homework and some research here. <laughs> it is, she believed she could, so she did, which is basically what we're yeah. going to talk about here. I love that. Where, where does that belief in yourself come from? Is there a particular person that was your biggest inspiration? You know, I will go back to my parents. You know, I will go back to my parents. Again, just watching them go through what they went through and pick them some, themselves up time and time again. Right. Now, today they're not millionaires. They don't have, you know, a huge stash of funds in their account, but the quality of, you know, what they bring to the table has been huge. And, and my dad often told me, he said, listen, no matter what you do, no matter what it is that you do, I know you're going to be great at it. So he would yeah. often tell me that. And, yeah. you know, my mom would just always drill it in me that go for it, just do it, you know, get it done. You've got it in you. And, you know, years ago, I remember, you know, attending, there was a church that I used to attend a uh, long time ago. 
and the pastor often talks about, you know, putting your best foot forward and firmly believing in your abilities and capabilities. And, you know, I'm always trying to, to better myself and, and enhance as much as I possibly can. And mm-hmm. I've realized that, like I said before, you have to overcome yourself. Nobody can do it for you. Right. And if you're waiting on someone else to do it for you, you're going to be waiting forever. Sure. So you might as well get it together, right? You mm-hmm. might as well believe in yourself. You might as well um, learn what it is that you need to learn so that you can get to where you need to get to. You know, some people look at me sometimes like, listen, you you barely have any followers. You barely have anything going at this at this point. But it's okay. I'm on my way. I'm on that journey. I'm on that journey. So I just have that mindset that, yeah. you know what, I'm going to get up, I'm going to get it, and I'm going to win it eventually. I love all of that. Um, you know, we have to remember, and I'm, I'm the same way, like I don't have 500,000 followers on Instagram right now. I have 500 to 600 range, right? And, you know, sometimes we can get caught up on that where we're, we're already, we're wishing and hoping for, for the big number. But yeah. if we continue to do, like you said, the compounding, um, not only belief in ourselves, but the actions behind it, and we trigger mm-hmm. our brain that we're doing this, we're accomplishing it, and it's little by little. And someone might look at it, and they don't see us at the end game, and they can't envision it, but we do. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> so, you know, 500, like we're thankful for every single one. And Gary Vanderchuk, who has millions of, of social media followers, he's, you know, um, a great inspiration, although sometimes he's, he's a little rough when he's speaking because he just <laughs> his mind. So you got to really, he's a, he's an acquired taste. Of, uh, but what I love about what he recently said is even himself, he reminds himself daily to be thankful and grateful for every single one because mm-hmm. nobody, nobody owes you anything. Right. Exactly. Like, like if someone's following you that like, how cool is that? Like, what do we, right. Why do we expect that we should have a million? I mean, let's just be grateful for if it's three people following you and they enjoy your exactly. content, you know? Exactly. Um, and the rest will come because the only difference from you having 500 and 500,000 or a million is just it hasn't gotten in front of as many people yet. So as it continues mm-hmm. to grow, just like watering the garden. Yeah. You know, I forget the name of the plant. It's a Japanese something or other. But it takes five years, and I heard this from Les Brown. Do you know Les Brown? Check yeah, it. I've heard Les Brown. Phenomenal. He talks about this particular plant. You have to water it for five years consistently before you ever see any growth. So, like, mm-hmm. how many people would give up? Ninety-nine percent exactly. are going to think it's <laughs> not going to work. It's not coming. But if you consistently water this particular plant. Not only mm-hmm. after five years is it going to grow, but this tree is massive. It's like 100 feet high, right? It's crazy. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful looking plant, but it takes that long to see any progress. So right. I think to me, what you're doing and, and what, what we're doing as entrepreneurs is not that water it today, tomorrow we get something to talk about. <laughs> uh-huh. But yep. the external wants to look at what do you got, you know? Exactly. Whether that's friends, exactly. family, people who support us, they want to see us doing well, but uh, it's mm-hmm. not always it's not always there. Just you know, on the daily of we do X and we get Y tomorrow. Yeah. And that's and that's the other thing that's that's an important point too is the perception, right? Because oftentimes people will quickly judge based on what they see with their own eyes, right? Mm -hmm. They may go to a page or they may not necessarily see what they expect or think they should see and automatically dismiss a business or an endeavor because Mm -hmm. it doesn't look like what they think it should. Whereas on the back end, there's a lot happening in the background. And, you know, I've had to catch myself I think it was a year or two, a year and a half ago, you know, I was, I was saying, man, you know, we have a long way to go. We still have this and this to do. And the person was like, listen, Evelyn, you guys have done so much already. Even if you, even if you only had one child graduate from high school, that's one child that you saved from right. not having an education or not having a future, right, to, mm-hmm. to look forward to. And thus far, we have five who have graduated, moved on, who are in college, one is working full time, 
Uh, we're trying to find a sponsor for the one to go to college. The other one went through our sewing program, trained other kids. She started her own business. She got married last year. And all of these are orphans who really had no hope for the future. So, wow. you know, just remembering that, that listen, yeah. It may look a certain way, but there's a lot, there's a lot going on and a right. lot we're building on. And that's how I, I, I told myself when I started this show, I realized I'm not going to have a million listeners on the first episode or anything like that, you know, but the reason I'm doing it is to impact as many people as possible. So that's what was encouraging about seeing the numbers starting to grow. Uh, but I said to myself, as long as my guest is willing to do this show and maybe one person could be impacted every week. Who knows who that person is? They could be the next person exactly. to create iPhone, whatever that particular product is, you know, in 10 years, right? Or it could be exactly. someone who starts a family of five that put them through college because they all of a sudden had some information that they didn't, or they think about something a little bit differently, hearing your story mm -hmm. and researching your mm -hmm. company and thinking about how they can start a nonprofit. Um, you know, so I'm going to, I'm going to give Olivia Larson a shout out. Did you connect with Olivia yet? No, no. So she started, she's 17 years old. Uh, she goes to Mount Mercy and she started what's called for every little handprint, which is helping, um, impoverished families. And the, the percent is crazy. 47.2% uh, of families in the city of Buffalo are in poverty, right? So their kids are, are they're not starting at the same place. Like they don't have the, the right books and the right, you know, marker set and how are they going to do art if they don't have that, they can't afford a calculator, things like that. So they're really not given the same set of what's called opportunity or chances. So mm -hmm. she, heard, she heard that at 16, I think she was 15, 16 in high school Amazing. and researched it and started it. And then you have someone like yourself living through what you've been through, researched it and started it. So you guys are both so inspiring to me just thinking about, you know, what, what I'm doing on, the, on a daily basis as well. And always thinking about who you can help out leading. Exactly. With, giving first, right? Um, exactly. And, and that's, and that's one thing too, you know, I think I alluded, mentioned it earlier, you know, as you form your coalition, also collaborate and empower yeah. others as you learn, as you get better and as you um, get better at what you're doing, you know, Make sure that you pass that knowledge on and that you can help someone else who's getting started too. Yeah, absolutely. Something I wanted to hit on too, you talk about um, not giving them or, or giving the orphans or people, kids that are impacted, similar to your story, not giving them a handout, but a hand up, right? Mm -hmm. so can can yeah. you talk about that? What do you mean by giving a hand up and not a handout? Well, you know, as far as giving the handout, I have to say when I was in Goma, we saw time and time and time again, organizations that came in to the country. And again, going back to the, uh, the point that I made earlier that be careful not to make assumptions as to what your customers want and what your mm -hmm. sponsors, what, push, what might push your supporters, I, I should say, to donate or to support your cause. Mm -hmm. um, because that's what we often saw, these organizations coming in and just giving, giving out, right? Giving handouts to people mm -hmm. where there's no long-term benefit. It's all short-term. Mm -hmm. All right, here's a t-shirt. Here's a candy bar. Here's some cereal. And these are things that people in that environment don't typically, like we don't eat cereal in the Congo. That's not a thing for breakfast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so really understanding, understanding that, that we don't, ICA, our goal is not to continuously send money so we can take care of their day-to-day -day needs. We want to give them the tools necessary to become self-sufficient. So that's what it is as far as giving them a hand up. We want to raise them up to a place where they can be self-sufficient to help themselves and then help their communities. We want to see these kids Mm. empower folks around them. We want them to become leaders, business owners, teachers, you name it. We want them to have impact where they are locally. Yeah. And that sounds again, like a topic that, that I, uh, Olivia brought to my attention was, and it's, it's well said, the difference between charity and justice, 
right? Like charity, hey, you know what? Here's a hundred dollars. Thank you so much. That is definitely going to help out. Maybe we can buy everyone mm-hmm. a box of Cheerios for the whole school or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Nice. We appreciate it. They they need it. But justice is like, you know, getting them up to the, the like you said, so they can actually learn, develop skills, you know, through mm-hmm. mentorship programs, learning how to read so they can go to that library that was built and actually start to learn about a better life. And then how to, what, 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 support system is in place so that you can go back and make sure that the learning is happening and there's a checks and balances. So what you're looking to do isn't just a the handout of one time donation. Thank you very much. Although you need it and would accept it. You're looking mm-hmm. for how that child that you're impacting can make a make the world a better place once they're starting to develop on their own. Exactly. And you know, we start the process with education, right? And education, they need the support for that because in the Congo, education is not free. Public education is fee based. So Mm -hmm. we come in and we, you know, we raise funds so we can pay tuition for children to go to school. And as they're going to school, we also provide the opportunity for for, uh, vocational training. So they get to learn to sew, they get to learn uh, computer. So we do computer training and agricultural uh, vocational training as well. And these are all programs that relate to what will work in GOMA in that environment, what will be successful and what they can actually utilize. So we've had many discussions with, with the volunteer staff at the orphanage to understand, all right, what is going to work for you guys? We don't want to start programs that we think will be good, but we want to understand, okay, what will be beneficial? for the children so that when they leave, they can actually start a business or get a job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and your firsthand experience with how everything works has got to be really detrimental and being able to create something that you know can be delivered on, right? Yeah. So that experience yeah. is like, you can't, you can't replicate that in a classroom, right? And that's right. why I think so many people want to learn and then just go, execute like in a like they learn it in school and they have a business degree and then they're going to run a business Mm -hmm. like you need to run that business for a little bit or work with someone else for a while learn the the right and then actually be able to implement them um i always like to wrap up with this i'm excited for what you have in store for us with this question so um okay i'm going to sit back and and enjoy this but again thank you for being on and and deliver thank you for having me everything that you have so far. This has been tremendous. If you can give our audience one message, and that's to be brave and bold in pursuit of their dreams, what would it be? You know, what I always say is get up, get it, win it. That's my tagline. Get up, get it, win it. You have to get up from whatever's holding your back, right? You need to get it go for your dreams, go for whatever it is that you want to accomplish in life, overcome that fear and, and win the day. You know, there might be trial and error. There might be, you'll stub your toe. It's okay. Get right back up. Mm -hmm. But if you keep at it again, that compound effect, if you keep at it, you will eventually win the day. So get up, get it and win it. I knew you were going to deliver on that. (laughs) (laughs) Not being prepared. (laughs) That was great. Get up, get it and win it. With Evelyn Kessler, that's going to kind of, I think we're going to work that into the title of this episode. <laughs> okay. I love it. Um, anything else you'd like to share with us? And again, if you want to help us out to find you on social, your website, um, any closing uh, information you want to share with us? You know, to close, I just want to thank all of our supporters, all of the people that help us and have seen us through our journey and who will continue to be part of our coalition. I really want to thank every single one. And as a reminder, we are looking for volunteers and board members. So if anyone is interested, please reach out. And I do want to mention that we do have a nonprofit leaders um, happy hour coming up February 27th. The whole point of this event, we're not looking to raise money. We're not looking to, there's no agenda with this. The only thing we want is to push collaboration amongst nonprofit leaders. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's so important to me is that we can come together and, and work together, partner more, 
and look at ways to really help each other, right? And the nonprofit sector, especially. So please come out, join us, and we'll have a good time. Hey guys, as always, a huge thank you for tuning in. Here are a few of my favorite takeaways from my conversation with Evelyn. Look, she was terrified to get started at first, yet she still did. She reached out to mentors to learn and she researched what steps she needed to take to get her organization off the ground, and she made it happen. I love the acronym that she stands by, PEACH. P, passion, you need to fight for your cause. E, easily digestible. What's your easy to understand story so your customers and donors understand what you're talking about? How can they purchase if they don't understand what you're talking about? A, accomplishment. Case studies or action items that back your story. C, coalition. Need your COI, your circle of influence. Hang with the group that are doing the things that you want to do. And then hear or listen. Hear from the group or the individuals that you're looking to help. You need to have a real understanding of what their needs and benefits are for what you're offering, right? So what will motivate your buyer or your donor? And then always you need to raise capital as Evelyn mentioned. So thank you, shout out to Evelyn for delivering that in a concise way. I'm so grateful for you checking out this podcast right now, especially if you're staying to the end. If you are, please leave me a review. I want you to know or send me a personal message. Let me know that you've been checking out the end of each episode where I do this feedback or I do these these recaps rather. And I really appreciate everyone who's been uh, engaged in the material as well. So I put this out for you. I'm hoping every time that at least one person can be impacted in a positive way. And uh, and the message at the end is, is to do that, is to kind of hear the messaging through me as well, not only um, in conversation, but also some bullet points for takeaway items for you each episode. So shout out to everyone who's been sending feedback. I appreciate the reviews and the messages that come in on social as well. And thank you for making this journey as much fun as it's been. Appreciate you helping me spread the love. You can check out more show notes and information at mikeduppodcast.com, powered by Social Chameleon. And you know what to do. Be great and be grateful.